Hello everyone. So while many of us are stuck at home right now, uh, I was thinking what better to do than drink some wine, but at the same time also learn a little bit about it. So I'm going to talk briefly about how to taste wine. Um, you can do this with any wine, doesn't matter what you have at home. So go ahead, grab a glass of anything and uh, come along for the ride. I've got a little fruit fly flying around because I've got my bottle and my wine here. A nice visitor. So anyway, uh, what I want to start out with, of course, is that wine is super personal. Everybody's palate is different. There's really no right and wrong when it comes to tasting wine. So the most important thing to remember is to have fun with it, right? Wine in the end should just be a great, delicious experience. Uh, it shouldn't be anything that's intimidating. Um, so that being said, let's start and just talk about uh, some basics. So really important, first of all, is the temperature of your wine. If you have a wine fridge at home, um, it's a great tool to keep your bottles easily at the right temperature. I keep my wine fridge at about 55 degrees. Um, and then I will take the wine out and leave it on the counter for a few minutes before uh, I, I serve it. Um, but anywhere from about 58 to 65 degrees uh, when you serve the wine uh, is great. It's ideal for both uh, reds and whites. So whites would be on the low end of that scale and um, uh, whites would be on the higher in terms of the cooler end. Okay, so secondly is your glass. Stimless glasses are super easy and fun and casual. I'm all about them in, in a lot of circumstances, but when you actually want to taste a wine or if you have a special wine, ideally you will have a glass with a stem. You will have a glass with a big enough bowl and rim for you to be able to, you know, get in there. Um, and for you to be able to swirl. So that being said, don't swirl just yet. So if you have your wine, go ahead and pick it up. It doesn't have to be red, it can be white, it could be rosé. And you start with how does it look, right? We start with the visual. So we haven't swirled yet, we're just taking a look. So what you wanna do is take your wine glass at a 45 degree angle, and either you're gonna have a white background of some sort, uh, if you have a white tabletop or a white countertop or even a white piece of paper or natural light, either one works. And you just want to see um, what color it is. So um, for red wines, like the one I'm tasting, um, it's going to range from purple, which means it's a young wine, and then it'll go to ruby, red, Garnet, which I would say this wine is garnet, to brown, which means it's old and it's oxidized, um, which generally, if it's been aged well, can be a really yummy thing. So that's one thing that the color of a wine can indicate. The other thing you can look at when you're looking at visuals of your wine is the gradation in the rim. So by that, I mean if you do this 45 degree angle, and you look, there is like an oval that your wine forms inside the glass. The rim around that oval is called the meniscus. And so the wider that rim is, the wider the meniscus is, generally the older the wine is. The teenier it is, the younger the wine is. So this has a small to medium meniscus, um, a garnet color, so somewhere in the middle in terms of age. Um, and not much gradation within that oval. So if you have the color changing from the top of the glass or bottom of the glass up and evolving, then it means it's, it's generally a much older wine. And I don't have much gradation going on. So I'll tell you um, what I'm drinking. Uh, I'm drinking Rootstock Pinot Noir from the Sonoma Coast um, in Northern California. And the age on this wine, the vintage, the year on the wine is 2017. So 
for color wise, that's pretty accurate, right? It's it's kind of in the middle of that color scale for a red wine. Um, now that's it's about three years old, um, and the rim uh, being medium to small is also a good indication of that. And it's not quite old enough to have that gradation yet. All right, all right. So we know how it looks, and now we just want to taste it, right? But one more thing to do before we get our lips on this delicious wine. So don't swirl just yet, we're almost there. We have this tendency to pick up the wine and swirl, but if we wanna get the maximum um, out of our, our tasting, then um, we, we hold off on that. So we've done visual, now let's do how it smells, the aromatics. Um, so without swirling, you just pick it up, sniff it, easy peasy. So what do you get on that? Is there vibrant fruit? Is there more of a faded dried fruit? So a vibrant fruit would indicate a younger wine, whereas a dried fruit would indicate generally an older wine. Now, the fruit could be a different type of fruit, right? It, different types of fruit. It could be a red fruit, which is what I'm getting on this wine. It could be a blue fruit, black fruit, again, dried fruit. Um, on this wine, I'm getting orange peel, raspberry, and there's some other notes that I'm detecting, detecting here too. So outside of fruit, you can get notes and aromas of flowers, herbs, there's some sage in this wine that I'm drinking, um, vegetables, I think I'm detecting some shiitake mushrooms in here, spice, earth, minerality, um, and then of course you want to think about oak. So how do you know if you're smelling oak in a wine, which would mean that it was aged either in new or, um, or old oak barrels? Um, if you're getting a lot of oak, it's generally going to be a new oak, new oak barrel it was aged in because those barrels retain a lot more of that quality still. Um, but in any case, for any oak, what you're going to get on the nose is toast, vanilla, baking spices, coffee, caramel, maple, smoke. Um, all those aromas would indicate the use of oak. Okay, now... <laughs> After all of that, nice patience. Let's swirl. Okay, so now that you've given it a good swirl, some oxygenation, take your nose back in there. Ah, do you smell a difference? Uh, I mean, to me, it just, it, the intensity of the aromas has become so much more powerful. Um, and the fruit, which was a little vibrant at first, I'm now getting a lot more complexity with that fruit, um, maybe getting a little bit more of the sophistication and age of the wine on that second round of smelling after the swirl. So that's why we hold off on the swirl, because we get a very different view of the aromatics and hints about the wine um, pre-swirl and post-swirl. So you can always go back through that list that we talked about after the second, uh, after the, the, the swirl, if you wanted to talk about whether there's one fruit that's standing out to you, uh, which would indicate a younger wine, or whether there uh, are multiple fruits that are in harmony, which would indicate an older and more balanced wine. Um, or you could go for in for the taste, the most important and fun part drinking. So let's taste. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, you'll see people, connoisseurs, psalms, wine geeks do this, you know, all this crazy machinations with their tongue. And if you notice, you know, I kind of let the wine 
dribble along my tongue. So I got a little bit of a taste along the front, the center, the back palate, and I kind of held it right before I decided to swallow. Um, you don't have to do that, right? You can just take a gulp and take a natural sip. But um, if you do do variations of the way you allow the wine to swirl and travel in your mouth, you might have a little bit of a different experience. So no problem playing around with that stuff. Um, it's fun. So the first thing we think about when we have tasted the wine is the dryness level. So is it a dry wine, which would mean that there is no indication of sweetness at all? Is it a bone dry wine? You hear that term bone dry. What exactly does bone dry mean? How it, does it differ from dry, right? Um, it can be a subtle difference, but if you think about it, dry just means no sweetness. Bone dry means it's either dry, meaning it has no sweetness, and it's tannic. We'll talk a little bit more about tannins in a little bit, but um, basically if you get that feeling of like a wine drying your mouth out, like sucking, you know, like a vacuum in, in your tongue, in your cheeks, that's basically a tannic wine. So if it's dry and tannic, it can be bone dry. And if it's dry and acidic, so acidic would be the opposite of tannic. Acidic makes your mouth water. It makes you want to take that other sip right away. Um, if it's dry and acidic, or if it's dry and tannic, it's generally bone dry, in addition to being without sweetness. And then if a wine is sweet, that means it has residual sugar. And a lot of different wines can have residual sugar. Okay, so now that we've talked about it, so this, this wine is dry. It's not bone dry, it's dry. And um, there's not much detection of residual sugar in this um, beautiful Pinot. So then we talk about body. Let's take another sip. Mm. And don't you love how the second sip tastes even better <laughs> than the first if, if you're drinking a good wine, which is the hope. And you start to see more of the complexity, right? Whereas in the first sip, it might have just been really fruit forward, and that's mostly what you've got. In the second sip, maybe you start to get other elements. So I'm detecting, um, although this is a fruit forward wine, I'm detecting that there's savory elements in this wine as well. And I really didn't get that until my, until my second sip. So let's talk about body. When you have it in your mouth, does it feel like skim milk, or does it feel like half and half? Pretty straightforward. Is it if it's if it's skim milk, it's a lighter wine. If it's half and half, it's a fuller wine. And then of course you have something in between, which would be medium. So light, medium, full. Um, obviously not an indication of the quality of the wine, just a different style. And um, some people like light, some people like full, and some people like it all. Okay, so the next thing you want to think about is acid. We mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the bone dry element of a wine. Um, it is, it's like a, a sourness almost, but in a good way. It, it makes, if the acid is not overly high, if it's balanced with the other elements in a wine, it's just that mouth-watering quality that makes you want to keep on drinking it. And then uh, tannins. Again, it's that sandpaper quality on your mouth, um, like you have a mouthful of cotton balls, just this drying um, experience, which when you verbalize it, doesn't sound very pleasant. Um, and some that's why some people don't like tannic wines. A lot of old world wines are traditionally tannic, um, whereas new world wines like Pinot Noirs from California tend to be not so tannic. They tend to be more acidic. Um, so, but you can have, you know, a great wine. Um, many of the great wines of the world um, have strong tannins. Um, so this one, like I said, is uh, it, 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 there's not there's not many tannins on this one. Okay, next we think we think about alcohol. <laughs> Almost dropped that one. We think about alcohol. Uh, so if you take another sip, third sip, for me at least. I can't see you guys, so don't worry about it. Take as many sips as you want. Mm. 
Yeah. So, um, if you feel heat on your back palate, right? So it's after when it's traveled across your tongue and just before you're going to swallow it or in your throat, once you're swallowing it, it will generally mean it's a high alcohol wine. And if you feel heat in your chest, if you feel the warming of your chest, that means it's a very high alcohol wine. So obviously you can see the alcohol by volume, the ABV on um, all the bottles where they're, they're required, the producers are required to list that. Um, and sometimes I use that as a tool when I'm shopping for a wine. You know, I um, tend to not to gravitate towards wines that are um, too high in alcohol. And for me, that means um, keeping it below 15%. Some people really love that, uh, that heat. Um, and so, you know, if you like, you know, for example, uh, Zinfandels, um, many of those, at least in America, in California, tend to be on that chest warming side. So ABV can be a really good tool for you uh, when you're shopping. So then we talk about balance, right? So we've kind of analyzed the aromatics, the color, um, the body, etc. how do we start to evaluate, put all those pieces together and evaluate the wine as a whole? So balance is when there's not one overwhelming element in a wine that takes over everything else. It's more cohesive, right? So you will have maybe um, an earthy flavor, as well as a floral note, um, as well as a spicy note, and not one is standout. They all are in very good harmony with each other. So that is when you have a balanced wine. And obviously an unbalanced wine would be when you just have one element that's just hitting you over the head um, and not playing nicely with the other elements in a wine. And complexity is the other thing that we use to evaluate a wine as a whole. Um, so when you take a sip, is there one, hmm, this is really nice. Um, I would recommend it. Uh, is, does, does it evolve on your tongue? Um, can you feel all the different elements evolving? not only sip after sip, but as it travels uh, through your mouth? Um, or is it just like a gulpable, easily drinkable wine um, that happens to be repetitive? And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, there is a place for what we call glue-glue wines, you know, that you're just like, yeah, this is good, life is good. Um, but when we're talking about a sophisticated, balanced wine, we look more for a wine that will have that uh, evolution. And then um, lastly, uh, we talk about finish. Um, so balance, complexity, and finish when it comes to the overall evaluation of um, the quality of a wine. So finish is what happens after you've swallowed the wine. So if you take a sip, fully swallow it, how long are those elements, the good stuff, the tasty stuff, lingering on your tongue in harmony. So let's try it and let's count. So count how many seconds all those elements that you like about the wine linger in harmony on your tongue after you have fully swallowed the wine. So if you got five to 10 seconds, that's a short finish. If it's still going for you and you're getting to 30 plus seconds, that's a long finish. 
right? And that doesn't mean they have to be there with the same intensity. But with glue glue wine, with the easily gulpable stuff, um, part of the reason you want to just keep drinking it is because you don't have a long finish. And so you just want to put more in your mouth. Um, with a wine of sophistication um, and complexity, you will have a longer finish, so you won't feel the need to, you know, um, to drink as fast. Even though it's so delicious, you might want to drink fast anyway. But you get what I'm saying. So this wine that I'm drinking, um, it's bright. It's lively. It has, I think, a pretty um, balanced amount of acid, so it does make my mouth water, but um, not overly. Um, and uh, I think one of the standout qualities is the orange blossom balanced with what I mentioned were the savory elements earlier. So there is a decent amount um, going on in this wine, and I don't find one element to overwhelm the others. So I do think it's a balanced wine. I think all of those things, even though they seem pretty disparate, uh, work with each other in this particular wine. Um, I do think there's an evolution in this wine. Um, and the finish was, was fairly long. It was still going after 10 to 15 seconds. So the mark of a quality wine, the formula, is a long finish and high complexity. So if you've got the harmonious complexity, if you've got that long lingering finish, then chances are you're drinking a pretty good wine. But like I said, even if you don't have all these elements, if you like the wine, if it makes you happy, then you're drinking a good wine. Good wine is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with me. Until next time, cheers.